I'm back to the topic of military psychology in this video, which has been sponsored by Audible, but more of that later. Now, uh, you may think that if you give a man a better weapon, he becomes a more effective soldier. I mean, it makes common sense, doesn't it? So, uh, which would you say was a more effective weapon, for instance? Is it the 18th century musket or the modern assault rifle? Now, what would the uh, salesman of a modern assault rifle tell you? He'll say, well, it's clearly the, what you want is the modern assault rifle, because if, for instance, there are some enemies great, very close by, you can give him a burst, burp, and you've still got some uh, rounds in the magazine, so burp, he gets a burst too, and burp, he gets a burst. Yes, it's short, it's easy to point, it's convenient, it uh, can go full auto, and you've got plenty of rounds in the magazine. Yes, at uh, in close proximity, it's definitely the thing, whereas if you're stuck with a musket, it's a long, heavy, awkward thing, uh, more difficult to point, and you've got one one shot, and okay, granted it's a devastating shot, a musket ball is a really socking huge piece of lead, um, tremendous stopping power, but BOOM! If you miss him, you won't have time to reload before he'll be on you, and even if you hit him, if he's got two friends with swords, they're very likely to take their vengeance upon you, and, and, and they will cut you, and cut you, and, and cut you, and cut... Yeah, he'd make his point about the, the proximity, and at a longer range, um, you could imagine that, well, you, you'd say, well, this thing is accurate up to 400 yards, and you've got a magazine with plenty of rounds in it, you can select single fire, you can... It's got almost negligible recoil, unlike the mule-like kick that that musket has, and it uh, doesn't... Uh, spew out loads of smoke, obscuring the target in front of you. Oh yes, it's it, it's more accurate, faster firing, you carry more rounds, it's just better in every way. It's the assault rifle. And I didn't ask which weapon would you choose if you had to go into battle, because I, I think I would choose the assault rifle, but it's interesting that if you actually see how effective these things were in battles of the past, the musket is more effective. It, it kills more of the enemy um, per round fired. And not just a little bit. Now, in, in this entirety of this video, I'm going to be using some rather um, speculative, conjectural, uh, let, let's say not entirely sound statistics, but it is something in the region of 20 times more effective than a modern assault rifle. Well, how can that be? Well, there's this strange rule that the, the better the weapon uh, you, you give uh, an, an infantryman, uh, the lower his kill, kill rate is. His effectiveness appears to go down and down and down. Um, so in, in the Korean War and the Vietnam War and in the Falklands, they all had considerably lower kill rates uh, than back in the musket days. Well, why is that? Well, you can imagine there's a, um, a chap advancing in his unit uh, with, with his musket and um, some enemy are seen. They're about 600 yards away, and so they carry on walking towards the enemy. And perhaps uh, the sergeant says, Yep, yeah, that's them. Keep going, lads. Won't be long now. And uh, if you're thinking of running away at this point, well, you don't, because you're shoulder to shoulder with lots of other people who are going forwards. And going forwards is a militarily useful thing to do, usually, if your orders are good. And uh, you don't want to be the one who turned tail, and everyone will see if you turn tail, and you're, you're quite close to the, the, your officers who will see you. And, and so, well, everyone else is going forward, and no one else seems to be worried too much about, OK, on. so you carry on going forwards, and the distance gets closer and closer and closer, and you might not actually... Uh, engage the enemy before he's 50 yards away. And then, of course, you're going to fire a tremendous huge volley at him, and that will be very effective, and lots of people will be killed, because what is the target? It's a, a big target of lots of people standing upright wearing bright, smart uniforms, sometimes with big crossing belts on them, just to make it extra easy to aim straight at the centre of the chest. Um, and that's the situation. Um, now, you wouldn't carry many musket balls, maybe as few as, well, sometimes you, you hear of as few as 12, but I think um, more like 30 to 60 is a bit more, a bit, a bit more typical. Um, whereas the chap with the assault rifle marching along on his own, or at least in a dispersed group, they can, you can see some of his colleagues over there and some over there, he might be some distance from his officer, and he sees someone at 600 yards and thinks, oi, oi, what's this? Aha! Now, he's got a weapon that, OK, it's not brilliantly effective at 600 yards, but he's got plenty of rounds, so why not give it a try? Bang, bang, bang! Bang, 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 bang! Bang, 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 bang! Where is he? Did I get him? I don't know, he's gone to ground. He was over there. OK, so you fired off a load of rounds now. You probably haven't hit anything. You've alerted the enemy to your presence and uh, given him a pretty good idea of your intent. Um, and now you've given yourself a problem because you can't see him anymore, um, and he's 
if he is a genuine enemy, he's probably now um, coordinating with some of his friends to uh, to attack you. Um, hmm. Maybe you could call in a helicopter now or some artillery to support you, but then you're not actually doing your job, you're getting someone else to do it for you. And if anyone does actually shoot to kill that enemy, it's, it'll be by uh, some ordnance other than your rifle. So in fact, you are less effective. As soon as you um, uh, find yourself trying to shoot at a camouflaged man hundreds of yards away, hiding behind that rock you think, um, you're very unlikely to hit anyone. And you're also quite likely to expend an awful lot of ammunition. Uh, one doesn't hear very often of musketeers running out of ammunition, but this is something that modern uh, uh, troops with fast-firing weapons uh, have to uh, really watch out for. So the kill rate uh, goes down. Now, how do you work out a kill rate? Well, uh, one thing you can do is you can look at the amount of ammunition issued to the troops on campaign and then divide that uh, by the number of uh, troops that they killed on that campaign. And there you go, you get the kill rate. And if you do this for the, this for the musket era, you get figures of between about 500 and 3,000. Um, so that seems quite a lot. So that'll be, let's take a middling figure, say um, 2,000 uh, musket balls fired for any, uh, every one of the enemy killed. But of course, that figure can be somewhat misleading because maybe they actually lost an awful lot of their ammunition when they, one of their ammunition supply dumps blew up. That happened, you know, you know. Uh, or maybe a load of their ammunition got captured. And of course, some of the people who died, died absolutely riddled with musket balls. And you know, a man with eight musket balls in him is just one man dead. So um, the statistics get skewed somewhat. But you can nonetheless make look at the figures and come up with some reasonable, though slightly, agree, I agree, uh, conjectural estimates. Um, now in Vietnam it was more like uh, 3,000 up to perhaps 50,000 rounds. And in modern Afghanistan uh, the US Army has been getting through about a quarter of a million bullets for every one of the enemy that they actually shoot. Uh, but again, that's a very misleading figure because uh, over half those bullets are used in training, not in battle, and they also um, get rid of a lot of uh, rounds which they think might be faulty, and they give uh, rounds as well to their allies. So the number of ones that are actually fired in anger towards the enemy um, is much more difficult to estimate. But we can say quite definitely it's a lot. It's definitely thousands. Now, uh, the best, the, that is the highest, uh, verified kill rate, and and verified perhaps is a, a well you'll see, um, is twenty thousand rounds uh, for every man killed, and that was in a particular action where the enemy had almost no cover, uh, and even then most of the killing was done by artillery and helicopter support. Um, twenty thousand rounds per per man shot, um, and that's of course uh, as as I've just explained is a misleading figure even then. So most of those rounds don't do anything. The modern doctrine, of course, is a suppressive fire, uh, but, but a man uh, with a, a weapon capable of keeping the enemy at a distance, men psychologically prefer to engage the enemy at a distance if they can, up, up close is quite nasty, uh, will quite happily just fire a load and load of rounds to very little effect. If someone's gone to ground and you can't see him anymore, he may have moved sideways and you're just firing at some rocks to no purpose. So if you do force the enemy to, to, to go to ground, you now, if you don't have support weapons to, to take them out, you have to get in there yourself. You have to get up close. And how are you going to do that, particularly on your own? Um, if you can, of course, coordinate with a team, uh, that's much better. But each uh, man would much rather be the guy doing the suppressing than the guy uh, going in. So who tends to go in? Well, um, officers and commanders, NCOs, uh, more senior types tend to go in. Um, the men who actually do the, the up-close work, they tend to be bigger, more intelligent and more charismatic. But these are just uh, correlations. There are, of course, plenty of exceptions. Um, now, <clears throat> with these uh, huge um, numbers of uh, rounds being fired in modern warfare, um, this can be explained to some degree by uh, tactics known as, for instance, the spray and pray, or there's the hose and pose. So what is, what is spray and pray? Well, you come up uh, to, the, uh, to a corner and you have reason to believe that there's an enemy over there somewhere, probably. So you go like that. That was the spray. And then the prey bit is that you hope that that hit something of military value, which you almost certainly didn't. Uh, but you have fired your weapon in the general direction of the enemy. So you have contributed, you've done your bit, you are fighting. 
uh, unlike the, lots of the other guys who were just dithering about the place. So that's the spray and pray and of course it uses up lots of ammunition and very very seldom hits anything. Um, then there's the hose and pose. Hose and pose is when uh, you pop up and uh, because it's, it's your turn, a few other people perhaps earlier in the day have done this and you feel uh, you better do something similar just to, you know, show, show willing. You pop up and perhaps with a machine gun with a belt or whatever, depends what um, um, weapon you've got. But let's imagine you've got a machine gun with a, with a big belt. You fire off the whole belt. You keep going. Clunk. Whew. Oh, right. And... Then you leg it and you go back to your pals who all slap you on the back because, yeah, you showed them you did your bit. Yeah, you made absolutely sure, hence the pose bit, uh, that you were being watched uh, because then uh, you, everyone will know that you've done your bit and you'll get that warm glow, the satisfaction, those pats on the back. And then everyone will forgive you if you don't perhaps pop up for a bit because it's somebody else's turn to do that now. Again, the hose and pose is of very little military value. Um, you spray an awful lot of bullets about the place and you're very unlikely to hit anything. Uh, this is, these are not tactics that well-trained and disciplined soldiers should be using, but uh, it seems that uh, uh, soldiers of all kinds will occasionally resort to that sort of thing. So um, muskets were something like 20 times more deadly, but they were fighting, as I say, uh, under different circumstances. And why? Well, men uh, would be shoulder to shoulder, and, and why would that be? Well, lots of reasons. One being command. You need to be able to fire big volleys in a coordinated uh, way and you need to get uh, blocks of men to march around the field together. And your, the distance that you can shout is very short, particularly when there's a, a musketry battle going on. So you need guys close in so that it's possible to control them all. And then if uh, the cavalry turns up, you need a dense formation of men to resist the cavalry. And if a load of uh, the enemy charges at you with bayonets, then you need a dense mass of men uh, to, to resist the bayonet charge. So yes, you need to have dense uh, masses of men. And because uh, muskets weren't that effective, weren't that accurate, perhaps I should say, um, you could, they could actually get away with uh, presenting such a vulnerable target, uh, which would, they would very seldom present for any great length of time, uh, because they would either charge in or run away. Um, so they got away with it. Um, now, uh, one of the effects, however, of uh, firing in this way is that you normally fired blind. Uh, I say normally. Um, there's no there's no figure. No one can tell you exactly how often they fired blind. But it was very common to shut your eyes or even shut your eyes and turn your head away a bit when you fired your musket. Now, you've got a big bit of jagged flint that's, that's chipping uh, sparks off a, a bit of steel in front of you. And of course, the edge of the, the flint will, will sometimes shatter. And so you've got bits of flint flying about. And then you've got sparks and a big flash in the pan. Uh, and that's happening right in front of your eye if, you, if you're holding the rifle like that. The musket, I should say. Um, and so you might therefore blink. And it's also quite instinctive to do that away from a big flash. But don't forget, it's not just your musket, because there's a guy here, and he's got a big flash, and a lot of the stuff will be going sideways from that. So any, any little protection that you've got uh, protecting your eye uh, from the flash here uh, isn't going to help you with the, the flash coming off his and, his, and his, and his, and his, and his, and his. So you've got this absolutely vision-dimmingly loud volley that's about to go off. Oh, here it comes. Uh... Bang! So you quite often fire blind because you've turned your head and or shut your eyes. Another reason you might fire blind is that muskets threw out so much smoke, um, both your outgoing and the enemy's coming the other way, that very often you couldn't really see where the enemy was. You just think, just fire into the smoke somewhere. Uh, one unfortunate consequence of this style of firing was that some men during this, as I say, just you, nothing can prepare you for how loud a volley of uh, muskets is. If you ever see a reenactment, uh, you'll be you'll perhaps be surprised by just how loud it is. But just un do understand this: those reenactors are not anything like as loud. They're using uh, they're using a, a modern uh, a gunpowder, which is not as loud as old-fashioned black powder. Um, they're using about half the charge. Uh, and uh, they're not ramming in a, a big ball of lead. So they don't have that sudden pop uh, as the ball of lead comes out. So, so those reenactors are not anything like as loud. So kaboom, a lot of men would go. And you see that I, I, I tilted downwards there. It was found in the Napoleonic Wars that a lot of men in the front rank uh, that were kneeling got shot in the back of their head by men in the third rank, which is a pretty grisly thought, isn't it? 
Uh, anyway, I seem to have strayed from my point slightly. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm going to be talking about something called Weapon Pull. Personally, I don't think it should be called Weapon Pull. I don't think it's a very good name for it. But anyway, uh, there are uh, uh, tactical psychologists who have decided to call this thing Weapon Pull. And it is descriptive of um, the, uh, the increase in the likelihood that a man has to fight if he's got uh, a particularly good weapon. Um, so um, you've got, say, uh, a slightly better rifle. And because you've got that slightly better rifle, you're more likely to use it. And the bigger the weapon, and the more effective, uh, and, the, and the, the, the sexier the weapon, if you like. I mean, maybe it looks futuristic. Maybe it makes a really cool sound. Maybe it comes with a huge amount of ammunition, so you can go and fire it a lot. There's something about this weapon which is perhaps better than your previous weapon, or better than the weapon of the guys around you, or better than the weapon that the enemy is using against you. And so. All these things that combine uh, in weapon pull to make you more likely to fight. So clearly this is a good thing. Give the men better weapons and they'll fight more. It turns out to be a lot more complicated than that. Now, um, one uh, example that I read about was a machine gun that was called Shouty. Well, it wasn't called exactly Shouty because that's a translation from the German, but it was called Shouty in translation. Uh, this was a German uh, MG42 on a tripod being used by a crew uh, in Italy in the Second World War. And uh, they were not any ordinary crew. Oh no, these were the Three Grenadiers. Oh yes, and they styled themselves on the Three Musketeers. Oh yes, lots of moustache twirling and ha ha! Like this, they, they wore slightly outlandish, outlandish kit and they affected outlandish speech and traditions and they became an, a, a team with, with Elan. Thing is though that Shouty, the gun, wasn't actually the original Shouty after a while because they replaced the barrel and they replaced the stock and then there was that time when they, they lost the tripod, remember? Oh, and other bits got, uh, got wrecked when that mortar bomb went off. And so after a while it was a completely different machine gun. But it was still Shouty. And similarly, the, the, the three Grenadiers, uh, of whom there were of course five uh, crewing this gun, um, their, their, their personnel roster kept changing as well because men got promoted or wounded or killed or went on leave or sent for extra training or whatever uh, and they, other men were brought in to make up numbers and yet each man brought in, I suppose they probably did it one at a time, uh, adopted the, the, the customs of, of Shouty's crew and the three grenadiers and they started wearing the kit and, and using the words and ha-ha! So they, this, this unit had Elan and when it was um, Came to, came to a fight, they, they shot, and they shot a lot with Shouty. Now, an MG42 is a weapon with, which has got a lot of pull. Um, it's, it's loud, it, it fires lots of rounds, it's, it's an impressive thing. So uh, you can imagine that that's one reason that it, it fired a lot during fights. But there are other reasons too. Crew-served weapons in general fire a lot more than just a, a, an isolated rifleman. An isolated rifleman is likely to be somewhere where perhaps none of the commanders, none of the NCOs or officers can see him. So if he just uh, you know, sits down in his, in his slit trench for a bit and has an urgent cigarette, uh, then you know, um, who's, going to, who's going to stop him and who's going to know? So um, that's one reason that uh, the, the, uh, the, the big weapons that attract the attention of officers tend to fire more. There's somebody watching, quick, everyone look busy. Also, in a crew of five, all five men are encouraging each other. This team has to work as a team for the gun to operate. So um, if the guy whose job is to feed the bullets into the side of it uh, is just sitting there not doing his job, but everyone else is doing his, then um, people are going to notice immediately. Oi, oi, our lives depend on this. Do your job. Oh yeah, right. But of course he knows that he would be noticed, so he feeds in the ammunition. All the men uh, encourage each other. Now, uh, they also uh, have a, a bigger weapon, and that seems to correlate with, with uh, um, uh, using them more readily. They also tend to have uh, machine guns of this sort, the sustained fire with a tripod. They tend to have big reserves of ammunition as well, and the more ammunition you're given, the more you tend to fire. Um, also, machine gunners tend to be bigger, stronger guys, and bigger, stronger guys tend to fight more. They also tend to be more intelligent than the, the grunts who have just given a rifle. And again, bigger, more intelligent people tend to fight more. Again, it's, it's a correlation. I'm not saying that all big fight people, uh, big intelligent people, make good fighters because that's not true. Um, 
Another reason is that you can't hide. Now imagine that there's a platoon uh, that, that's spread out over some area and uh, it's supported by a shouty and one of the riflemen, he's about 40 yards that way, uh, stops firing. Is anyone going to notice in the middle of a battle? But if shouty stops firing, everybody is going to notice immediately. So just as the guy feeding in uh, the, the rounds, he can't hide within his crew, shouty cannot hide within the unit. So quick, quick everyone, let's do our job, let's fire a lot. Um, they tend to have quite a long range as well, and as I said before, men prefer engaging the enemy at a distance. Uh, so that again is another way of, of encouraging people to use a weapon. There is another uh, uh, reason that Shouty might have fired more than uh, one of the riflemen uh, that it was supporting, and that is to do with the natural aversion to killing that humans have. Um, if, you've, if you're an isolated rifleman, you see an enemy, you take aim at him, you take the decision to shoot, you shoot, and you see that you've killed that enemy, you did that, no one else. Whereas, if you're the man feeding the, 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 uh, the, the rounds into the machine, well, um, you didn't kill anyone, you were just doing your job feeding the rounds. No, no, I just fed rounds. If you're just the guy fetching the ammunition, bringing stuff up, if you're the guy looking through binoculars and calling out ranges, oh no, I didn't kill anyone, no, it was my job just to call out ranges. I, I, I never pulled the trigger or anything. And even the guy who pulls the trigger, well, I, I was one of a team, I was just firing at the targets that were, were called out to me. Um, I, I was just doing my job. We all, we all, we all uh, were, were responsible. So it's as though with a five-man team, the personal guilt, the feeling of responsibility for the deaths of those that uh, the, the weapon kills, uh, gets diluted amongst the team. So the men are psychologically more prepared to do their job, even though they know that it's contributing ultimately to someone's death somewhere, possibly. So Shouty shouted a lot. So if you've got um, a big effective weapon and all the circumstances I just described, you're more likely to shoot. Uh, more likely to, yeah, to use your weapon, fire it, fire it in the direction of the enemy. Now, um, if you, this goes across the board. Um, for instance, they have uh, ex um, observed in firing ranges. So this is not in a military context. This is in a firing range. People have gone there you know, just to have fun because they like shooting at paper targets. The people who turn up with more guns and more uh, ammunition and bigger guns they fire more. Now you could say, well, that's because they're probably greater gun enthusiasts, but uh, it seems to be a bit more than that. You give people big guns and lots of guns and they, they fire them more. They, they, they get caught up in it. Um, and if uh, the, the, you give a policeman a weapon, say he's got a truncheon, a, a baton, or whatever, um, there's a chance he might use that baton. If you give him a baton and pepper spray, he's more likely to use the baton than he previously was. He's also more likely to use pepper spray. Of course, he didn't have pepper spray before, but you see what I mean? With each weapon you give him, he's more likely to use one of the weapons. Uh, if you give him a taser, he's more likely to use one of his weapons. If you give him a gun, a pistol, as well, he's more likely to use any of these. And tasers, tasers get used a lot by police. Um, where, when they was uh, first thought, shall we give policemen tasers? Uh, there was this thought, well, a lot of people are getting shot because the, the policeman has to shoot because he can't be sure. Uh, but there are circumstances maybe when you would use a gun, but if you had a taser, you would taser them instead. Uh, okay, so the number of killings should go down, right? Because all of those occasions when someone had to shoot someone because he didn't have a taser will be replaced by people getting tasered instead. But that hasn't happened. The number of people shot with the pistols... Um, has not gone down, and my goodness, so many people are now getting tasered. Quite often, uh, one, one gathers unnecessarily. So the more weapons you give a policeman, the more likely he is to use one of those weapons, whichever one it is. Um, and, and, and big guns um, tend to end up going into battle more than you might think. For instance, the Bren gun. Um, the Bren gun was the section support weapon, but uh, quite often uh, the Bren gunner or the BAR, uh, Browning Automatic Rifle Gunner in an American section, uh, American sections are usually called squads. Um, uh, they would be a, you know, a, a big, strong guy, and they were quite often very aggressively used. Bren gunners went in when, uh, when there was a house that needed clearing, a load of guys went in there with their bayonets and grenades to clear it out. Quite, the Bren gunner would go in there and da 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 I've got a Bren gun! Um, they would go in there, and it seems that part of the reason they were happy to get stuck in is they had a 
Bren gun, which was which was more umphy than the rifles uh, around them, or possibly more umphy than the what was coming the other way as well. And looking at it from the other side, if you've got a weapon that's lesser, if you've got some small, light, cheap-feeling thing uh, that's got a reputation, may not be deserved, but a reputation for being unreliable, well, you've got an automatic built-in excuse, haven't you, to not use the thing. You're not going to fight because, you know, why should I? They've got this... Everyone else has got a better weapon. I'll just leave it to them. Uh, besides, I, I, I'm going gonna, gonna to watch these stairs just, just in case something, someone comes down those stairs. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll let everyone else do the actual fighting. You've got that built-in excuse. Um, it saps your morale um, to have a less good weapon than everybody else. Um, now, in Afghanistan, it seems that when 5.56 millimeter caliber, the NATO rounds, the things that uh, SA-80s and the like uh, are shooting, when those are, are fired at uh, Taliban, uh, quite often the Taliban near enough ignore them. Whereas if uh, 7.62 is fired at them, they get a lot more wary. And if someone opens up with a 50 cal firing half inch thick lumps of lead at them, they run away. Uh, so the, 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 the power, the caliber of the weapon makes a significant distance, a uh, difference. And uh, in places like uh, Afghanistan, uh, people issue with a 5.56 uh, quite often surreptitiously um, just actually, actually swap it for a 7.62 because 7.62s are so much more powerful, more accurate, longer range, have better stopping power and they're just sexier weapons. And I got a, I got a, I got a 7.62. Oh, you're just using a 5.56 pop gun, are you? Well, I've got this beast. And, again, people have looked at what happens to patrols. Men with 7.62s are 20% more likely to fight, to actually shoot their weapons at the enemy on a patrol. But there is a converse to this. Now, you may think that, well, if they are 20% more likely to, to fight, they've got this boost because they've got this bigger weapon, then you could say, well, the 5.56 are 20% less likely. But no, it's not quite like that. What happens is that the people who were were, were, were this likely to to um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it <laughs> they were this likely to uh, to fight um, uh, if you give them a 7.62 they then become this likely to fight whereas the ones not given don't stay where they are they become less likely to fight so if uh, and, and with a modern section, for example, they tend to have very mixed weapons. Uh, a modern section doesn't just have a Bren and, and uh, short magazine uh, Lee Enfields. Uh, they might have bunker-busting uh, rockets and they might have uh, grenade launchers and loads and loads of different weapon systems, pistols and all sorts. Um, and so there's a huge spread of weapons in a, in a modern section today. And um, though if some of them are given a better weapon, the others fight less. So overall, has your, um, has your section, has your platoon, has your unit, has it become more effective or has it made no difference? It's really difficult to disentangle all these different factors that, that affect each other and feed into each other. Um, it is said that by giving uh, someone very strong weapon pool, you can boost the effectiveness, effectiveness of soldiers by 50%, whatever that means. Anyway, I suppose I, I should say something about my sponsor, Audible. Now, Audible, just in case you don't know, you've been living under a rock or something, is an enormous website uh, which uh, stocks audiobooks. And if you go to www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige or text Lindy Beige to 500 500, then, well, you can take advantage of a special offer because you will be uh, given entry to a 30-day free trial, and you'll be able to download your first audiobook uh, free, gratis, and for nothing. Um, and, oh yes, there's and, you'll get two, count them, two audio, Audible Originals. What is an Audible Original? Well, it's uh, something which is only available on Audible. These are these are audio products, audio books of the conventional sort, but also dramas with, with acting and sound effects and you know, all that. Yes, those are available too, and there are really quite a lot of them, and they're only available through uh, Audible. You can get two, two of them for free if you go to www.audible.com, stroke Lindy Beige, or text, as I said before, were you listening? I hope you were, Lindy Beige to 500 500. Um, and the selection there is is, uh, is is pretty impressive. And uh, I know that some of you like uh, that you, you like fantasy stuff. For instance, I noticed that one of the Audible originals was Terry Pratchett's um, 
oh heck, what was it called again? Unseen Academicals, that was it. Uh, and so yeah, that's something you might want, uh, want to listen to. Also there's sci-fi, and some of you I imagine are into sci-fi, and I saw they had uh, some dramatised stories set in the Aliens universe involving aliens, I'm guessing, but I think with good reason, because I noticed that they had pictures of aliens on the cover. Um, uh, and if you like war memoirs, and if you're watching this video then you probably do, uh, well I just typed in, just experimentally you understand, uh, war memoirs, and I got 31 pages of results. Uh, one of which I noticed was Dadland by Keggy Carew, uh, which is a book that I, uh, I enjoyed. I've, actually, I've, I've met the writer at the Wigton uh, Book Festival it was. Um, and that was the book uh, which gave me a lot of material for the, uh, the, book, uh, the video I made some while ago on the French resistance. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's not strictly a war memoir because uh, it's written by the daughter of the man who did all these things. Uh, he was, alas, not long for this world and uh, his daughter realised that it's, it was important that his story uh, gets set down uh, before it got lost. Um, he had a, a, actually a very interesting war fighting out in the Far East in Burma and then later with the, the French resistance. Uh, anyway, so that, that's, that's one which I, I would recommend. Anyway, so... Uh, that is uh, Audible, my sponsor. Thank you highly much, Audible, for sponsoring this video. Now, um, I've been talking about weapon pull. Now I should talk about the opposite, which is weapon push. Although I really don't see the, the pull or the push. Neither of these terms makes uh, intuitive sense to me. But I, I think the idea that is that you um, you push the enemy's fighting spirit back somehow with weapon push. Anyway, weapon push is the decrease in a man's likelihood to fight given that someone else has a more powerful weapon, particularly the enemy shooting at him. And of course, a weapon push can be colossal. Um, bingo callers in the 8th Army in World War II uh, would sometimes, uh, rather than saying uh, two fat ladies, 88, would say driver reverse, 88. Uh, why drive a reverse? Well, uh, this is a, a tanker's uh, joke um, because the 88mm flat gun had a fearsome reputation in the desert, which was not entirely deserved. But the thing is that a weapon can do a lot of its, um, can be effective by having an amazing reputation. The Tiger tank, for instance, had a reputation that was wildly greater than the actual capability of the vehicle itself. Um, and uh, it worked both ways. Uh, the Allies were enormously more frightened of Tigers than perhaps was rational, and uh, the Germans had enormously more confidence in Tigers than perhaps was entirely rational, considering especially how often they flipping broke down. Uh, but that's another story for another day. Um, and anyway, the, uh, there are weapons like the MG42 that I was talking about earlier. Remember Shouty? Um, that has a completely unnecessarily high rate of fire. It uses up bullets, and someone has to carry those bullets, you know, and lead is heavy. Um, but the thing is that this unnecessary uh, um, amount of lead flying through the air has great weapon push. Uh, other people being shot at are much less likely to shoot back uh, because of this, this, just this overkill. Even when almost all those bullets don't hit anything, it has weapon push. OK, um, and uh, there was uh, there was a, a training film in World War Two uh, for training uh, British infantry and uh, it had footage of MG 34s and 42s firing away Spandau's um, and uh, a lot of the people who had been in action against the Germans who were watching this uh, film would would jeer and laugh and slow hand clap and be somewhat critical because it would show footage of those those machine guns firing, but instead of the brr, brr, brr noise, it, they had dubbed on the da, 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 da noise of a Bren gun firing. And all the people who'd ever heard a Spandau firing went, yeah, that is not what it sounds like. But they didn't want to scare the people that they were training up, the, the, the recruits, uh, by playing them the actual sound that this terrifying machine gun made. Um, so they were aware, it seems, the editors of that film, uh, of the, um, the, the, the power of weapon push. Um, now, um, uh, if um, you fire something really, really big, it has a uh, much greater effect. As I was saying earlier, earlier on, um, Taliban would tend to, to run away if you fired something really big at them. But what about four really big things, like a quad, a quad 50 cal, which the Americans had during World War II? That was 
terrifying to be fired at. It made a terrifying noise and it would, it would just crash through, it would cut through foliage and, and smash limbs off, off trees uh, in a, a most disconcerting way. So if the enemy's firing one of those at you, you get out of the way pretty quickly. And the Russians had heavy machine guns. The Germans had a, a two centimeter cannon, again, uh, that had the same sort, of, same sort of push effect. If they're firing that at us, we're not going to fire back at all. So you end up with an awful lot of men uh, cowering behind cover and dithering and repacking their rucksacks over and over again because sometimes in the middle of a, a fight that turns out to be of, of st strange um, importance. Men get fixated on some task that they'd rather be doing than, than, than firing back at that thing because did you hear the sound it made? Okay, so that's, that's weapon push. Um, and uh, just as those uh, uh, British infantrymen were lied to, so American tank crews, it seems, were kept in the dark about the inadequacies of the Sherman. They'd been told, and the American public had been told, that the Sherman was the best designed tank in the world. And there's an interesting stat. Now, at the, uh, the start after the Normandy landings, when these, these raw uh, tank crews were going into action against the Germans, for every uh, Sherman knocked out, there would be uh, typically four casualties amongst the crew. That was in the first week. By the 15th week it was down to just one. Just one casualty per knockout. So how can we account for this? Well, um, the crews are better trained, uh, they're more experienced, yes. Uh, they've put more armour on the Shermans, yes. They've tinkered with various other things about the Sherman to make it a little bit better, yeah. But well, this isn't known, but tactical psychologists looking at it and trying to explain this enormous drop in the casualties per knockout um, have concluded, I think not unreasonably, uh, that it may be that when the crew of the Sherman realises that it's overmatched, they come up against a panther or a tiger or, or something, or they think they've come up against a panther or a tiger, um, rather than uh, carry on fighting in the tank, they abandon the tank and then the tank gets hit when it's empty. And that's why the number of men uh, uh, who became casualties per knockout went down so markedly. Um, now, um, in, in, in the Far East, the, the Japanese uh, had a, a bit of a bunker mentality in defence, and sometimes they were incredibly difficult to shift. But then you bring up the flamethrower tank. Now, I've talked about flamethrower tanks uh, in another uh, video and uh, did I just point the wrong way? I usually point the wrong way. So uh, either that corner or that corner, uh, I think a link, as I hope, just appeared to that that uh, video, in which I talked a lot about uh, how extremely effective uh, the crocodile flamethrower that the British had uh, was. Well, flamethrower tanks were used in the Far East against uh, bunkers with Japanese, very stubborn Japanese. These Japanese would just not surrender. They just wouldn't surrender. Well, they tried everything to get them to surrender, um, but they would just sit in these bunkers and because they were, it seems, just fanatics who would rather die, uh, even a horrible death like being, being um, burned in the bunker with, with a flamethrower uh, rather than come out and surrender. Uh, one problem that the Americans had in, in getting them to surrender was that there was no Japanese word for surrender. Um, but they would nonetheless give it a go and they would get the, a loudspeaker out and someone who spoke a little bit of Japanese would, would yell at them, now listen you stinking Japs, get out of that bunker or I'm damn well gonna burn you out. Nothing. So they burned them out. Now later on, in fact very near the end of the war, they learned that it was actually possible to get these Japanese to surrender, but you had to use the right language. And uh, I think it's it's worth where is it there? It's worth reading you an excerpt from this uh, book, War Games, which is uh, the book that I got a, a lot of the material that I'm talking to you now about. Tactical psychology book. This was sent to me by a viewer, uh, which is great. Thank you, viewer, uh, who it later turned out was actually a contributor to the book. So there was a little bit of self interest there. But we've been corresponding back and forth, and it's been a it's been a, a fascinating thing. Anyway, uh, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd entertain you with uh, the speech that they came up with, which actually worked for getting uh, Japanese to surrender. You'll notice that it's somewhat different in tone. Um, Attention, honourable Japanese soldiers. I am the authorised American commander for this area, and I have been ordered to make it secure. Attention, I have flamethrowers. I will use flamethrowers to carry out my lawful orders. I regret the unfortunate consequences resultant uh, on the use of flamethrowers. Japanese soldiers, I order you to come out and assemble properly at designated landmark. Uh, and that, it seems, did actually work. Um, so you have to 
learn the enemy's psychology and uh, make the appeal that, 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 that works with that particular enemy. Uh, it's a great shame that they learned that. I nearly said trick there, uh, technique, I should say, because it's not a trick. They weren't, they weren't trying to fool the enemy to the enemy's disadvantage. Uh, it's quite definitely to the enemy's advantage to surrender, given that the alternative was being burned alive uh, or burned to death uh, in a bunker. Uh, anyway, um, uh, how did I get onto that? Um, sorry, that's a bit of a... <laughs> um, oh, yes. Um, so there is weapon push. Now, through the ages, weapon push uh, has been uh, taken many forms. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, the weapon. It's any, any bit of kit could do the job. So, for example, you might have really shiny breastplates on your armour and, and the enemy will think, oh, wow, those guys look as though they've got really good armour, really expensive, well-looked-after armour. They, they must be men to be reckoned with. You know, our armour's looking a bit rubbish, really. It's not anything so shiny. Maybe we shouldn't be taking them on. And uh, war cries and loud drums and so forth have uh, a similar weapon push, a pushing effect on dampening the enemy's uh, likelihood to, to, to fight. Um, and, of course, uh, coming up uh, to uh, more recent times, there were deliberately loud exhausts, for instance, on some World War I planes, particularly those using ground attacks that were going you know, across the battlefield and would send men scurrying for cover, which, uh, far more than actual, the actual threat of the uh, aircraft genuinely represented. But, but when something really loud goes over the top of your head, you throw yourself into cover, don't you? And uh, there's the Stuka. Uh, the Ju-87, uh, with, ah, here we go, uh, I had this prepared. Um, the model, I think I made this when I was nine or ten. Anyway, um, these things, uh, I don't know if you know this, by the way, did you know that um, technically you shouldn't really call these a state, it's a, it's a Junkers 87 or Junkers Ju-87, um, calling it a Stuka, which people did because it was the dive bomber that the Germans used, um, doesn't actually technically distinguish it because um, the German authorities who were uh, buying aircraft for the Luftwaffe stipulated that all German warcraft should be, uh, aircraft should be allowed, should be <laughs> capable, beg your pardon, of dive bombing. Even the Hankel 111s, the, the biggest bombers that the Germans had, were technically uh, capable of dive bombing, though I've never heard of the they're ever being used that way. Uh, so calling this a, uh, simply a Stuka doesn't... But anyway, the, one of these! Um, they had the, this permanent um, undercarriage. This undercarriage doesn't fold up, you see. It's permanently down. And so they thought, well, since it's there, why not strap a siren to it? So that uh, when you switch the sirens on, the air intake uh, whirls the little propellers in the sirens round, uh, and it makes that... noise that you've probably uh, heard dubbed onto completely inappropriate aircraft uh, in the movies. Almost anything going down. I've even heard it um, uh, put on, on helicopters. Um, so any aircraft that uh, starts uh, going towards the ground or speeding up makes that stuka noise. No, it didn't. The British actually um, uh, copied it to some degree by adding whistles to their bombs so that uh, in, in the later war when the, when the RAF dropped a bomb it went uh, so again, that's another gets added to any dropping bomb um, thing in the movies, but that, that's actually late war RAF bombs. Anyway, um, oh yes, that, that, I remember why I said that now. So that's to do with um, weapon push. And you can imagine if you are carrying in some trench and you, a Stuka is above you, JU87, and you hear that absolutely terrifying noise, even if uh, the bomb, when it finally drops, misses you by miles, um, it's very likely to keep you in that trench and for quite a lot longer than you otherwise would have, uh, have stayed there. So weapon push is a very powerful psychological tool um, uh, that, that militaries can make uh, uh, great use of. Um, and uh, about 30% fewer men will fight if the enemy is perceived to have uh, a more powerful weapon a better weapon, sexier weapon, noisier weapon, whatever it is. A better weapon, I suppose. It's the perception. It might be the noise that causes the perception. So, um, that's a very rough figure to be taken with a huge pinch of salt, but something in the region of. Um, now, uh, I've been talking about the, the, this book, War Games, um, and I did. I really liked it, um, but um, I do have criticisms of it. One being that he keeps talking about this term effectiveness, and you say that this adds 30% to a soldier's effectiveness, and this 50%, and this up to 90%, and so forth, without ever really defining effectiveness. What, what is effectiveness? Um, it, and to what 
baseline is this number applied. So if you have two soldiers who are notionally standard average soldiers and you put them in a fight then each is 50% likely to win, presumably. Uh, so the notional soldier's quality is of 50%. So if you give him a 50% boost, is he now a 100% soldier? He's now guaranteed to win the fight? Or is it 50% of the 50% that we started with, in which case he's now a 75% uh, effective, likely to win type soldier? Um, I, I don't know quite how these figures stack up. Um, and it seems that uh, 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 tactical psychologists don't quite know how all these things stack up as well. But you have to make common sense uh, decisions. If there are certain things that only uh, apply in circum certain circumstances, well, then they don't count. You, you take those away. Um, now, uh, there is a big problem with tactical psychology, and that is, although to be fair, he, he absolutely uh, admits to this, um, uh, th th this is no criticism of the book, um, is that getting good data is really difficult. There are some things uh, that people will happily talk about and other things they really won't. And if ever there is a mess up, uh, people tend to close ranks and, and protect those who made the mistake in the military. Um, so there is a definite bias towards studying uh, victories rather than defeats uh, and quite often it's heroic extraordinary victories against the odds that gets that studied uh, and very easy victories uh, turkey shoots and so forth um, perhaps gets uh, get ignored and not and don't form enough of the data um, and uh, fear is a good example of something which people will actually happily talk about so uh, people who have been in war uh, and people who are even in war now, currently serving soldiers, will quite happily talk about how terrifying battle is and how scared they get. Uh, and why is that? Well, it has to be scary for them to appear brave. If they, they say, oh, actually, uh, war's not scary at all, I wasn't scared, uh, then what they're doing is not terribly impressive, is it? Whereas being scared and yet overcoming that terror and achieving something regardless, that's manly, that's impressive. So people are usually quite happy to talk about fear. And if anyone tells you that they weren't scared, they're lying. They're happy to say that. But there are other subjects like aversion to killing and guilt and uh, disobeying orders and so forth that men are very considerably less likely to talk freely and accurately about. So it's difficult to get data of the psychology in that sense. Uh, it's also very difficult to get um, the right facts and figures because they're not the sort of things that get written down in the history books, particularly of older wars. Um, now, um, another criticism I have in the context of push and pull, apart from the fact that I don't like the terms push and pull, maybe we relative weapon effectiveness or something, some other term might be better, is that actually I think it's wrong to think of them as two separate things. I think really they are one thing. Weapon push and weapon pull are, are, are a single factor. Um, because if you remember, I said that if you give some men 7.62s, they shoot more, but the other guys shoot less. Uh, and so the pull and the push effect are actually all part of the same phenomenon. If you've got uh, two battalions who've been fighting alongside each other very successfully for a long time, going from victory to victory, and they're, they're very happy working uh, with each other, and you get a, a, a load of the new rifles have just arrived. They, 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 woo, they're sexy, and oh, they're really good, and they make a really good noise, or whatever, I don't know. They're somehow better, um, but you've only got enough to supply one battalion. What do you do? If you give it to this battalion, uh, well, they may think, hey, we've got the new rifles. Oh, oh, sweet, okay. And they may go into action more readily. But their neighbours, who are supposed to be supporting them on the left flank, they're going to think, well, why, why should we take the risk? They're, they're going ahead and they, they seem to be doing fine. So why? And they, we've, you know, obviously we're not good enough to get the new rifles. Um, and they, don't, they, they fight less. And truly two units working well together is, is uh, something worth preserving rather than one doing a bit better, but at the expense of coordinating with its fellows. Um, and all right, so maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should give half the men of each battalion the new weapon. Oh, great. So now you've created a tremendous logistics problem. Um, you've now got to supply not just the whole unit with one type of ammunition and this whole unit with another, but now you've got to get the right ammunition to every individual man, depending on what he's been issued. Great. You've just uh, created a lot of problems there. And of course, now you've got to train both battalions in the use of the new weapon. Uh, so you've created the training problem as well. Um, and within that battalion, um, all the guys who have not been issued the, the new sexy, fast-firing, loud and, and cool, futuristic weapon, uh, they, they feel, well, 
I'm not going to do anything. Or he's got the new weapon. He can go ahead and use it. You've given all of them an excuse not to fight, not to pull their weight. Uh, so they were happy in before. They were comrades all fighting together. And now you've actually perhaps degraded the fighting effectiveness of these units by giving them better weapons. So um, there, is, there is this push and pull. I talked about uh, in that my the video on, on the crocodile flamethrowers how incredibly effective they were on the enemy morale. So they had tremendous weapon push, if you like. But they also had some weapon pull effect in that the escorting infantry who were meant to be uh, going forwards with those crocodiles were also a bit scared of the flames and thought, well, the flames seem to work really well. Do I really have to be exposing myself here walking across a field? Uh, can't I just let the tank do all the work? So they were actually more reluctant to fight because of the weapon push uh, of, the, of the weapon that was on their own side. So I don't think there's any separating the, these, these two effects. You have to, you have to uh, meld the two together. And as for a new section, the, the, the modern sections where we have a tremendous spread of weapons, if you're looking at the, the effectiveness of just say one section of 10 men or 30 men in the platoon, that sort of size, uh, because they're carrying so many different weapons, if you make one alteration, trying to work out the complicated effects of that are just horrendous. And it seems at the moment, tactical psychology is not up to the task. Uh, but that doesn't mean that um, it's not worth trying to find an answer. Just because a, a problem might seem insoluble doesn't mean that the, the, the journey, the inquiry, isn't worth it. Uh, people should be looking into this and trying to work out what are the effects of changing, uh, giving people better weapons or less good weapons or more uniform weapons. Um, and, uh, you know, an interesting task? Well, it's an interesting task. Anyway, I hope you found this talk reasonably interesting.